Okay, let us read verse 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17 reading together. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for seeing us through yet another week. Lord, for granting us this opportunity to come to your house. Lord, away from the world, to rest, to study thy word. Lord, what a blessedness we have at the end of this week. Father, we pray as we come, you would search our hearts. Lord, wherein we have sinned, show to us. Father, we want to repent, confess. We ask that you would cleanse us and wash us of all our sins. We desire that this night as we come, you would be pleased to be in our midst. Lord, we know that the words of men, our own wisdom, we will never understand your word, nor understand spiritual things. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come. Lord, send to teach, to open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, to see truths. Lord, we pray for conviction as we learn about interpretation. We pray that Lord, we would not um, desire anything else but to know the mind of God. Father, be in our midst tonight and teach us. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So tonight we are going to move to the final series and a few things we want to cover. Look at um, page one and look at session number three. Okay, session number three. Daily devotion, what are the available tools and commentaries? These are questions that arise now and, now and then, in fact, very often. Say, I want to do my devotion, but sometimes I'm stuck. I don't understand words. I don't understand a phrase. I don't understand um, this whole text. What, what is it talking about? I'm confused. And then we get discouraged. Now, what are the available tools there are to help us? And then, what about commentaries? Very often you ask, commentaries. Um, is it okay to use commentaries? Um, is it safe to use commentaries? So we want to cover those things. And then, um, then we move to interpreting genres, the different kind of writings in scriptures, poems, narratives, epistles, and how to draw lessons from them. Now, different genres, we approach it differently, but we apply the same method of interpretation. We'll look at that. And then finally, we have some case studies, all right? Uh, we have some case studies. We will look at um, four or five commonly misinterpreted passage um, that is very common and then I want you to apply what you learn and then come to the conclusion what the passage means okay so that's what we're going to do by God's grace tonight okay so now we move to page two okay you have to bear with this these two parts because they are quite um, Verbose, they are basically just giving you tools, okay? So please bear with them. Some of you may be familiar, some are not. So um, those who are not, pay attention. Okay, so how many kinds of tools are available? Now, the very common ones that people turn to is number one. 1A, study Bibles. Study Bibles. What are study Bibles? i give you an example. How many of you have study Bibles? Okay, many of you have, some of you don't have. Now, what is a study Bible? A study Bible is a Bible that has um, different things included in it. Um, they are not adding to God's Word, all right? So, but they are explaining um, some things in there. So you look at point 1A1, all right? So they may include the themes, synopsis, authorship, dates of each book. So, for example, if I turn to the book of um, the Gospel of John, all right, what a study Bible does is this. It gives you, in the beginning, an overview of the book of John. Okay, an overview of the book of John. Um, so, for example, I don't know, you can see. Look, this is just one whole page. An overview of the book of John. Episode, uh, the Gospel according to John. All right, so background, like um, who is John, um, the author, the date, the purpose of writing. How did this writing come about? Why did the person, why God move this person to write? And then the content, and it also gives you an outline. Remember when we do book study, I make you write outline. All right, chapter one versus what to what, God is covering what. Chapter two versus what to what. So an outline. 
Okay, now, do you know why this is important, this is useful? You always say, when I read, I'm just lost in the details. Now, this kind of outline allows you to have an overall picture of the book first. Understand? Or even a chapter. So as you read, you roughly know, okay, chapter 1, oh, it's about manifestation of Christ. It's about Christ appearing. So as you read, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about, this is about Christ appearing, Christ coming to earth. Okay? And then, um, and so on. So it helps you to give you a picture and you know what, where you're going. Okay? But, I have to say, not all outlines are good. Alright? That's important to note. They are, they are useful guides. Um, as you get more um, into, as you know God's Word better, you would be able to identify, is this a good outline or not? Okay? So there are many, many different um, brands of Bible, um, um, study Bible, so it's all there. <clears throat> and then in study Bibles, you also have um, comments, all right? So at the bottom, a bit like commentaries, at the bottom of it, they'll say, oh, verse this, verse that, um, okay, what the person is talking about, um, it might explain some of the words. So here, like it says, oh, devil, all right, devil. Devil means slanderer, adversary. It might give you some other users in the Bible. Okay, and, and so on. Then he says, oh, like, you're reading the Feast of the Tabernacles. Then, then you go, oh, the Bible always talk about the Feast of the Tabernacles. What is it? So in here, it gives you at the bottom the Feast of the Tabernacles, what it, what it is, and so on. Okay, so these are study Bibles. It help you to study the Word of God. And of course, they have um, maps behind um, and, and um, yeah, maps behind and commentaries of certain things. And some of it will have like all the prophecies, how they're fulfilled. Okay, so tons of things, tons of things, study Bibles. So this is like in one place. Okay, so that is one thing you can use. But look at your notes. Okay, now there are many different kinds like point two, um, Reformation Heritage, um, Schofield and Ryrie. Now I put a note there, those used to be very, very popular, 1A3, Schofield and Ryrie but they are dispensational, very dispensational, all right? It's not reformed at all. It is dispensational in, um, in its views. So when you read, when you pick up a Ryrie and, and um, Schofield Bible, as you read the notes at the bottom, you will find it very conflicting to the reformed faith, okay? So that is how you know. But anyway, I just want to say like, for example, I have this um, King James Nelson, study Bible. I, I bought it because it was the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Um, so they made a very nice Bible. So I bought this one. And as you read inside the notes, you will find that it is both reform and dispensational. <laughs> okay? You will, sometimes you read, it's, uh, this part, they're reform. Another part, it is dispensational. Okay? So those of you who do not know what is reform or dispensational, um, go to our website. We had a session covering that. We had the notes and the sessions there. So it's, you would see different um, um, kind of contradicting commentary in just one Bible. Okay, so now we move. Um, point number one. Um, like I say down there, okay, you have to be careful. Um, one IX, okay, one A9. Beware of the, of the fact that the footnotes and summaries can be influenced by textual criticism and different views. Okay, remember we studied a little bit last or previous session, what is textual criticism? Textual criticism is people say that, well, we do not know which are exactly God's word. We have to figure them out. They're still figuring it out. Okay, so I give you an example. I wrote there. I, I'll, I'll just read to you my study Bible. Now, my study Bible in um, John chapter 5, verses 10 to 16. Okay, you know some of you, you read study Bibles, huh? they have like, oh, verses what to what? Okay, like, verses what to what? Disobedience of the people. Then you reread that another, it summarized the, the verses for you, right? It summarized. Now, those summaries are human summary, huh? those are not God's word. Okay, so summaries are, some of the summaries are very dangerous, like the one I have, John chapter 5. It, the, summer, the heading of those verses, John 5, 10 to 16, the heading is this. The heading is Christ breaks the sabbath <laughs> christ breaks the sabbath that is the summary so if you read oh this this john chapter 5 verses 10 to 16 the summary is jesus broke the sabbath 
Now, if Jesus broke the Sabbath, do you think we can be saved? We cannot, because Christ came to fulfill the law perfectly. If Christ breaks the Sabbath, it means Christ is a sinner. Then we have no more hope. A sinner died for us. We have no hope. Okay, so do you know why a person would summarize it as Christ breaks the Sabbath? Why? Would the person be a reformed person or a dispensationalist? Would be a dispensationalist, right? Why? Because dispensationalists believe that the Ten Commandments do not apply anymore. So therefore, breaking the Sabbath, commandment number what? Four. Very good. Breaking commandment number four is no big deal because it's dispensational. So you understand? So when you read the summary, you have to think, okay? Otherwise, you get a sublimal message to you <laughs> and you start changing in your thinking. So that's just one example. And I want to read to you my study Bible, all right? Now, very interesting. John chapter 7. Okay, let me just read to you my study Bible. I, I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is I want you to know examples of what can, be, what can go very wrong in you just reading your study Bible without thinking. Okay, that's why I'm doing this. John chapter 7, verse 53. Okay, now let me read to you John chapter 7, 53, um, these verses and look what, the, what my Bible study notes tell me. John chapter 7, 53. Okay, it says this. It says John chapter 7, 53 to chapter 8, verse 11. Wow, well, that's quite a lot of verses. It says, my study Bible notes say this, certain ancient manuscripts do not contain this passage. Hmm? Okay, so this is very common. This is what, what we call this textual criticism. All right, the textual criticism is they criticize the text. Should be in or should not be in. So this, this author says certain ancient manuscripts, old manuscripts do not contain this passage, while others place it later in the gospel. But he says, okay, after he tells you that, he says this. Oh, but certainly the passage records a historical event in the life of Jesus. So we need not doubt its authenticity. Good. <laughs> well, all right, why do you say that in the first place? Now I'm a bit doubtful. All right, so he says, so this Bible says, oh, many manuscripts don't contain that, but we should not doubt it. But in my same Bible, in Mark chapter 16, okay, in my same Bible, its comments on Mark chapter 16 says this. Mark chapter 16, you know, the occasion of the um, adulterous. Now, Mark chapter 16. Now, now, for this passage, my Bible study notes says this. Ancient manuscripts. Okay, favorite words, all right, for textual critics. critics ancient manuscripts, old manuscripts. Ancient manuscripts contain two different endings for Mark. While some suggest that Mark did, in, did indeed intend for this gospel to end at verse 8. So he says some manuscripts say it should end at verse 8. So a whole bunch of verses should be thrown away. Um, and it ends on a note of fear. So in the light of uncertainty to these verses, listen carefully, it may be advised to take care in basing doctrine upon them. Do you understand what I say? So he said, be careful. This part, ancient manuscripts, probably is correct. It doesn't contain these verses um, from John chapter, um, from verse 8 to the end. And it says, don't base any doctrines on it. All right, so now let me read to you one of the verses in John 8. Okay, um, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Don't base a doctrine on this because very dangerous. These verses probably are not in. Okay, and then it says, He that believeth is baptized and shall be saved, but that he believeth not shall be damned. Believing in Christ. He said, No, don't build a doctrine on this, it's dangerous. Now, you see, study Bibles, what I'm, my main point is read it with your eyes open. Understand? Okay, think as you read it. And understand there's this thing called textual criticism. They will always say, this is in, this is not in, this is in, this is not in. When you read those, just ignore it. I'm not saying they're not good, all right? Some have good footnotes, useful footnotes, but you have to be very discerning it's about study Bibles. Okay, so that is what I want to talk about now. I want to highlight to you 1AX, number 10. Soft copy tools. Now, there are eSword. Some of you use it. It's free for Microsoft users. You can download it. Very useful. They have uh, many different co commentaries and tools in there, eSort. Or those of you who want to buy Sort Searcher, look for um, Deacon Adrian. He found a good deal, something like $45 on CD, uh, if you buy in bulk. 
All right, ESOT is also very popular, um, very useful tools. Okay, I won't elaborate, but basically in there, they have commentaries, they have um, Bible dictionaries, which I'll talk about what it is, um, various things. Okay, very useful. Search, very easy search tools. Okay, so if you want, you can download ESOT, which is free, and they have many commentaries in it. I'll, I'll talk about commentaries afterwards. Okay, now very quickly, now we move on. So many of you ask, but how do I get an overall picture? Now, you can either look at Bibles, uh, study Bibles. They give you overall um, description of a book. So before you start reading the book of Numbers, and then you read in front, it gives you some idea what the book of Numbers was, the background and all that. So sometimes it's useful. But there are books that are written purely to describe the whole Bible, give a summary of every book of the Bible. All right, there are many books like that. <coughs> One, exam one example is like this bird's eye view. So it's overall view. Bird's eye view of the Bible by Noah Koshi. All right, Noah Koshi, I, I listed it there. So this is a very simple book, very easy to read. <clears throat> if you want to have a copy, there's one in the library. This is my, my own. Um, so it's, it's very easy reading. It gives you an overall picture of, of um, the book. I, I've read many um, different um, summary books, and I think this is one of the sound ones. All right, quite trustworthy. So now you know what is, what is this introduction to books. There are many. Baxter, for example, very popular. Baxter, very thick, but it's very dispensational. It will tell you very openly that the Old Testament people do not have the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament people were saved by obeying the law. Okay, so you read that kind of background, you, you, you get confused. You just have to know. Okay? okay, let me move very quickly. Concordances. What are concordances? Okay, what are concordances? 1C. Now, concordances gives listing of scriptures containing a particular word. What is it so useful for your devotion? Why? Now, this, for example, you read, you want to study about grace. Grace. All right? Then you just, you just, anyway, they are free on the internet. I give you examples, strong, screwed You just type in grace, or you just look under grace. And it will, it will show you all the Bible verse, the good ones, practically every single Bible verse in the Bible that has this word grace in it. Understand? Okay, those, let's call it concordance. Now, why is it useful? Because, like, for example, I mean, Adelphi Group, we are studying about woman of grace. Then we want to know the different aspects of grace. So I just type in grace, every single Bible verse that has grace in there. Then I read every verse, then I say, oh, the Bible has different usage of grace. Different passage uses the word grace to mean different things. All right, then, so it's very useful for you to understand more. Uh, for example, you can also use it for um, searching certain characters. Remember, we studied in, in Colossians, the last chapter? Oh, you left Ty Tychicus. Who's Tychicus? His name appears. Then you just look under Tychicus. Some commentaries will have Tychicus. Then, oh, all the occasions in the Bible that Tychicus was mentioned is there. Right? Very good, right? Straight away, you read all oh, this. He was involved in all these things. So, straight away, as you do your devotion, Ah, who is this person? You look at some concordances or Bible dictionaries. Ah, then you get a background of the person. See, your Bible, your own devotion time is actually very fun. It's like a little um, investigator um, studying and analyzing and doing his investigation. Okay, so it's, it's, it's very meaningful, very fun. Okay, so that's the meaning of um, concordance. You understand what it is? Okay, they are free on the internet. You can just type in the words and then it will pull out everything for you. Concordance. All right, so there are three very famous ones, Strong's, Crudence, and Young's. These are the famous ones. Actually, you don't need to buy them. All these are free software now, okay? Just need to search them. So which one to use? The joke is always, if you're a strong person, use Strong's. All right, if you're a young person, use Young. You know what's the last one? <laughs> you're a crude person, use Crudence. Okay? So now, these are the three famous ones. They're very useful. Ah, last time when I was a Christian, young Christian in secondary school, then they had, don't have all these electronics. I buy this kind and then I flip, you know? Flip, then they're, they're made of the cheap ones, made of Indian paper. After some time, you keep sneezing. So now, no need. You just type in, you get, get it all on the internet free. You buy this e-sort, sort searcher, they're all in there, free. Very, very useful. Okay? So now, um, okay, Bible dictionaries, what are they? They are also in a lot of this free software. Bible dictionaries. Now, Bible dictionaries, you should use. It's useful for your devotion. 
Okay, because this directly answers the question. Many of you ask, what's a Pharisee? What's a Sadducee? All, this, all those things. Okay, Bible dictionary is just like a dictionary. Dictionary means what? Dictionary means it provides definitions and explanation of Bible topics, Bible things. Okay, so what is a Pharisee? Then you go and check Pharisee. It gives you a lot of background about Pharisees. Then as you do your devotion, oh, Pharisees are like that. Sadducees. Sadducees, they tell you, oh, Sadducees do not believe in resurrection. So, oh, that is what Sadducees are. Then when you see Sadducees and Jesus arguing, you understand the argument. If you do not know who are Sadducees, you will read, read, why are they arguing about this? I don't understand. Huh? All right, so Bible dictionary is very useful, number one. Number two, D1, D2. Bible dictionaries contain background of characters. So you want to read, oh, David, King David. So you take a Bible dictionary, you have David, and you tell you all the history about David and everything. All right? You do family devotion, all these very useful tools, okay? So, um, and also give you definition, uh, like records of places. So for example, you read, the church of um, um, Sardis. Church of Sardis, what is it like? What was unique about the church of Sardis? Then you read the book of Ephesians, and then it talks about um, the Ephesus church, where it is built. What is the background? What is the political background? Then as you read it, ah, then you understand why Paul talks about certain things. You know, if they're very corrupt. And then you say, Paul would say the church is the ground pillar and ground of the truth. All right? Then you find out, oh, because in Ephesus, there is the temple, the female temp the temple of the goddess, many, many pillars. You see, then you understand. Isn't your devotion very exciting? You say, ah, now I know what Paul said that. Because the people, they always went to the temple, they saw all the temple pillars. And then Paul would use words like that. Paul went out of nowhere. The, the church of God is the, the, is the temple, and is the ground, ground and pillar of truth. Then you read Bible dictionary and say, Oh, Ephesus, there's this church, this temple that was like that. What they worship. And then you begin to read, don't commit adultery and all those. Then you realize, oh, because they always go to this temple, the men, the family men will go to this temple and commit adultery with the um, priestesses. All that kind of background. Then as you read, you understand. So, very useful Bible dictionary. Okay, good to have a soft copy. And what about measures? You say, uh, how, how much, how uh, one, uh, they say, a uh, measure, how, how much silver, how much gold, what does it mean? I don't understand. A Bible dictionary will tell you. All right, how much is it equivalent to today? Why is it, why do I want to find out? Because then you know how much the person is stealing or how much the person is giving away, how much the person possesses. You get an old picture. Oh, okay, how rich is this person? Or how poor is this person? Understand? So weights and measures, very useful. Um, even like cultures, you read the, the parable about the virgins, right? with the lamb watching. So what's this? How many of us get married the night before all of us supposed to light the lamb? Then we don't understand what is it about. Bible dictionaries, very useful. You go and read about the culture of marriages then. How come there are people who light the candle? And then well, I run out of candle, run, quickly run to someone and borrow, borrow candle. How come halfway through the groom comes? And then why does Jesus say, when the groom comes? Today when who comes? A wedding. We wait for the groom or the bride. <laughs> we wait for the bride, right? But Christ always talks about the groom coming, the groom coming. Huh? Don't understand. But when you read Bible dictionary, it gives you all this cultural background. Then you understand, oh. And then you draw more and more lessons for yourself. So Bible dictionary is useful. So when you don't understand, you don't have to be stuck. All right, get one of these soft copy. All right, in there it describes many of these cultural backgrounds and so on. Stop reading your your um, magazines, um, fashion magazines. Uh, stop reading also. Just spend your time reading dictionaries. When I was a student, I loved to read dictionaries. Not not Bible dictionary, Oxford dictionary. <laughs> I just keep reading dictionary. I just love to read dictionary. So we, just like now, when I'm free, I just click dictionary. Oh, just read. Wow, wow. Just read dictionary. It's like encyclopedia to you. Right? Just keep reading. You will grow and more and more you understand the Jewish culture and all those things. Okay? So it's very useful. For example, like I, many of you already know this, but some of you do not know. Many religions say Jesus did not declare that he's the son of God. 
Hey, sorry, never declared that he is God. Jesus, you say you search the Bible, Jesus never ever declared that he is God. That's why the Muslims, the Mormons, the Seventh day Adventists say Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus is not God. They say, oh, then you doubt. Yeah, Jesus didn't say it. True. But when you go to all these Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, when you read the cultural background, you begin to understand. When Jesus said, I'm the Son of God, the Jews immediately understand he's declaring himself to be God. All right? So how would you know that? You read. You find out. Okay? So Bible diction is very, very useful. But like I said again, oh, for example, like the hours of the day. Oh, at what watch Jesus was crucified? At what watch? At what watch? And so what is watch? What time is that? All right? Then you check Bible dictionary. Oh, that watch. Please don't ignore measurements in the Bible. Go and find out. Because they have significance. Like when Jesus, God purposely said he was crucified at what watch? At noon. The, 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 the darkness came upon the earth at that watch. Then you realize, oh, you mean God is saying the brightest time of the day, the earth was filled with darkness. All right? So don't just skip. Use dictionaries to help you understand all these things. Um, the other thing I want to say also, maps. Okay, so now that is Bible dictionaries. All right? I gave you some examples there. So please do not say anymore, I don't understand, I read, I don't understand. In this Bible dictionary, they even describe many of the words that you don't understand. So many things in there, very useful. They even have Bible um, summary of books. The book of John, book of Romans, they even summarize for you also. Okay, so useful too. But I want to warn again, uh, every single tool that you use, beware. Textual criticism, criticism is infested in there. They will say, this part not in the Bible, this part in the Bible, this part sh uh, should not be correct, this is not correct, this one should be like that. It's full of those things. Those you got to filter, understand? Okay, you got to filter those. Um, okay, so now, what about maps? Do you ever use maps? Use maps. Use maps. You know why? Maps give you an overall picture. So those Bibles, most of our Bibles behind, there are maps. When you read, go to the map and look, oh, where, where? Why do you want to read? Because then you realize, wow, you mean Paul went all this distance on foot, on ship. Then you get a, you get a size of what he went through. Is your, is your devotion boring when you go through that? Because we don't bother. All right? We read, we don't say, I'll skip, I don't understand. No, there are many things you can use. Then you read, oh, that people came from the three taverns to visit um, uh, the Apostle Paul. Then the Apostle Paul was so encouraged, right? He saw that these people came from the three taverns, and then he was so encouraged by it, he could press on, although he was going to prison. What does it mean? Why did the Bible give us three taverns? Because the three taverns represent the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, right? Right or not? <laughs> Good, I'm glad you shake your head. Huh? It's just a place. You don't read, wow, the three taverns, and then Paul got so encouraged and he could press on. Three taverns. Ah, he must have thought of the Trinity. That's why he got encouraged. No. You go and check three taverns. Wow, three taverns. Three taverns, the people walked to visit him. Then you check three taverns. Oh, where it is. Then you found out that it is, the distance is so many kilometers. Then you check. I checked when I read it. So, wow, it means that it's like you and I, we have our brother Colin. Colin is not here. Colin and no, Colin is not here for Fiona. They stay in uh, where's that? Mandura, right? Mandura. They stay in Mandura. Now, tavern and to where they visit Paul. If you look at maps, it's the distance of here to Mandura. You know why Paul was so encouraged? Believers that he don't know walk. Okay, all of us. Let's all walk to visit brother Colin and Fiona. Huh? you don't tell us. We walk a few days. Finally, reach there, visit him. How would he feel? He would be so touched because he said, you walk all the way to visit me. Is your devotion boring? Because we don't bother. We just feel, oh, tavern, what is that? Move on. You take your time. Find out from the maps. Then you ask, why was he encouraged? Then you realize. Then you ask yourself, your devotion becomes meaningful. I must be like that. I'm not asking you to walk, <laughs> to go and visit people. Miss any distance, any difficulties. You make an effort to encourage another person that is in trouble. Right? So devotion, is it boring? It is not. It's because we don't make an effort. Okay? So I'm just trying to help you be excited about your devotion. So for example, like millstone. Um, you know Christ say, uh, if someone offends this young one, better for him to tie a millstone and drop him, drop him into the sea. Right? 
Then you read a uh, millstone. Okay, you move on. No, take your time. Go check the dictionary. What? Why did Christ say millstone? What are millstones? Then you check dictionary. Then you realize, oh, got two kinds of millstone. There's a big one and a small one. Christ is talking about the big one. <laughs> he didn't say tie the small one and jump into the sea. He, Christ purposely chose that one that is the big one. That needs a donkey to push on. He said, tie that one and jump into the sea. Then you read, wow, Christ is serious here, you know. This must be a very terrible sin, stumbling someone. And then you ask yourself, when you read Leviticus, they say, okay, you can trade anything. You can trade your coat. You can, you can, if someone owe you money, remember you read Leviticus, someone owe you money, you can trade in your coat, your house furniture, trade in anything. But God forbid one thing. God forbid you to demand the person to give you his millstone. Do you understand why? You just read, cannot, cannot exchange millstone. Ah, this Old Testament funny people. Then you move on. Right? We do that. But when you check Bible dictionaries, then you begin to realize what millstone meant to the families. Millstone is their livelihood. Without the millstone, they can't eat. They've got no money. They can't make food for themselves. Then you realize what God is talking about. Right? You don't push someone. Don't push even someone owe you money. You have the right. You don't push him to the point where he is desperate. See? So many things. You use, just use dictionaries. You can find so many things and you start to ask yourself questions. Okay? All right? That's why, that's why it's, all these tools are useful for you. Um, you don't have to say, I'm not preparing Bible study, so I don't need to do all those things. Then don't complain that your, 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 your devotion is boring. <laughs> okay? So that's, those are dictionary maps and so on. Now, I want to move on next. Okay? Can we move very quickly to number three? I have to move like really quickly. Okay. Um, how many of Gospels? Some of you are taking that in um, FEBC online. You know what is useful about how many of Gospels? Um, is this. Sometimes many of you ask, how come I read, Tim, uh, Math, uh, how come I read Matthew? It says this, but John, it says another one. How, what is the overall picture of Christ's life? How many of Gospels does that? Give you the whole picture of Christ's life on earth from a different angles. Okay, now I want to move to theological, theological resources before I move to commentaries. Page number three. Now, theological resources. Remember in session one, I keep emphasizing to you. If you are not interested in theology, your, your, your devotion will be very boring. You will just read things as they are, surface. But when you study theology, theology of God, theology of man, theology of salvation, theology of end times, theology of all this, systematic theology, that book I recommended to you, $10. All right, it's very good. The more you understand theology, when you do your devotion, when you read about the covenant, when you read about... Um, the law, everything is very clear, and then you understand it very clearly. It's very meaningful. You must have theology. Don't think that theology is for Bible college students. It is not at all. If you take yourself back 50 years, the kind of theology that people in the lay, lay people know is far more than us. All right. So no, we are very backward. <laughs> okay. So theology. So I wrote in there many resources for you. That ten dollar book is. It's, it's so easy for easy reading, and it's real theology in there. Okay? Um, burning Bush journals, you get it on, online. Um, FEBC classes. Many of the materials are online, the theology materials. All right? Just go to the website. Someone recently said, Wow, I didn't know all this book on FEBC website free. All right? FEBC focus on helping you to grow. So they put all these materials free. Okay, so all these things, they're all available there. Um, how do you increase your theological knowledge? Come for DHW, come for BBK, come for church fellowships. You keep absorbing theology. You will grow. When you do your devotion, it will be different. It will be different. Okay, so now I want to... No questions, all right? So these are the tools. Bible concordances, one word everywhere. Bible dictionary, it's like a dictionary. Anything you don't know, go to that. Bible dictionaries give you all the description and the details. Okay, very useful tools. Now, I want to move to commentaries. I will try and do this fast. Okay. How many of you use commentaries? One, two, three, four, five, really, six, seven, that's all. Okay. How many of you don't use commentaries? All that. Okay, so maybe this is the minority. Now, very often, people ask, so many commentaries. What are commentaries? Commentaries are this. Commentaries are people who write, who read each verse, 
and then they explain the verse to you. Some commentaries are very detailed, every single verse. Some commentaries skip verses. Some commentaries summarize a whole passage. That is called a commentary, all right? They read it and they make a commentary to you. It's their thoughts. Understand? That's a commentary. All right? I, I put in there the, the famous commentaries. You just look at page 3, there's Albert Barnes. Page 4, there is John Gill. Page, there's Adam Clark, Kill and Delich. Matthew Henry, C.H. Spurgeon. Well, C.H. Spurgeon is not really a commentary. John Calvin. Now, these are the famous ones. These are the ones you typically find in softwares. That's why I summarize this. Okay? Now, fair bit of work needed to be done to put this together. Um, but this is not all. Okay, I just remind you first. I put this in a table form for you. So every time you want to use a particular commentary, you just check this table. Okay, the strengths and the weaknesses. Okay? But I don't want you to take my words. When I load the notes into the internet, uh, into our website, I will, I will load this table as well of the details of what I say here. For example, okay, now I put page 3. Albert Barnes, his strengths and the areas of concern. So if you read Barnes' commentary, what is his strength? Now, you read, if you find some strength, you can add yourself, okay? Now, he advocates total abstinence. Now, Barnes is one of the very few who rightly interprets the usage of alcohol, okay? His is total abstinence, absolutely no alcohol, all right? So Barnes, the strength is that. Now, then I will quote to you, when I send out the notes, I will actually quote Barnes, defending total abstinence in his commentary. Understand? So I will actually have the details. Down here, I'm summarizing for you. All right? But his con the co areas of concern, when you read Barnes, okay, Barnes is quite good. He's quite devotional. It's quite good. But you must know his weaknesses. Then you do not think that way. Understand? Now, his areas of concern. Number one, advocates unlimited atonement. Means he believes that there is no limited atonement. He believes that... Um, God did not intend to save only the elect. Okay? Um, so he also denied the original sin. Original sin. Now, what is original sin? Means he do not deny, he denies that he denies total depravity. Means he believes that man can choose to believe in God. You do not need God's special grace. Means God do not need to come in and work in your heart. Means he believes that man has good in him. Intrinsically, although the, there was the fall, that fall did not affect him totally, did not affect his will totally, he can choose. So when you read Barnes, you must know that is where he comes from. Okay? So he, believe, he do not believe in irresistible grace, in other words. Okay? Now, he also believes it's favorable to textual criticism. When you read Barnes, he will say things like, oh, this part, according to some manuscripts, are not there, not there. Those kind of things, you just skip. Okay? So those are his weaknesses. And he's quite liberal, or he began liberal theology and then it, and so on. So now, next, Gill. Now, Gill is very detailed, page 4. Gill is very detailed, almost verse by verse. Okay? Um, Gill is very strong in his um, language, and he knows the Jewish culture very well. So when you read Gill, he often will tell you, you know, the Jews did this, the Jews' lifestyle was like that. So a lot of that, quite useful. Um, what is his um, areas of concern? Baptistic view of covenant. He will write about the covenant, but he has a baptistic view of the covenant. That it will still creep in. Old Testament people needed the law to be saved. Okay, so, and he's against infant baptism, and he's believed to be hyper-Calvinist. Alright, so but he, Yale is a hyper-Calvinist. You read, you've got to understand. He would actually um, say that God hates, God hates sinners. God hates the unelect. All right. So all this, I don't make it up. I, I will quote it and I will put it in the notes, load it on the website. Okay, understand? So I don't say he's, he is hyper-Calvinist and I don't quote to you why. All right, so it's in there. Now, Adam Clark, another one. Adam Clark emphasizes holiness. So when you read Adam Clark, you'll find it very devotional, talking about wanting you to be living a holy life, okay, that kind. Um, but he's Armenian. Armenian means, what is Armenian? You want to know it's Armenian, you just, whenever you think of tulip, you just have opposite of everything. It means he don't believe in total depravity, he don't believe unlimited atonement, uh, un unconditional um, grace, he does not believe, unconditional election, he does not believe in limited atonement, he does not believe in irresistible grace, he does not believe in preservation of sin. That's Armenian. Bottom line, they believe that you can 
lose your salvation. Okay? So when you read, you say, oh, ah, now you know why he, certain passages you interpret it like you can lose your salvation. He believes in sinless perfection. Wesleyan means he will write about holiness, right? He believes that a believer on earth can become sinless, sinlessly perfect. So sometimes you read, 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 you can get depressed. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not like that. All right, so you have to understand where they come from. All right, and his armil means he do not believe there's a millennium. Okay. Now, kill and delete, next, very quickly, kill and delete. Kill and delete, very exegetical. In other words, if you are a Bible college student, you will understand what he's saying. He will really pull the text apart. Pull every word apart and exegete it, exposite it in the languages. All right? Generally, it's, it's too difficult for the lay people because he analyzes all the Hebrew words and grammar. Okay, it's good if you understand those things, but it might be a bit difficult. But they definitely adopt um, textual criticism. Okay? Now, Matthew Henry, many of you. How many likes Matthew Henry? Many. Oh, many. Okay, Matthew Henry. Okay, Matthew Henry, very, very popular. One of the most popular. When I first became a Christian, I bought a whole volume, or the whole volume, I don't know, 12 volume, big stack. All right? Then Sharon got saved. I recommend that she bought the whole set also. We need to find out all these are free on the internet. <laughs> They're all free, all right? No, no need to buy. All right? No need to stock up space and pay a lot of money, all right? All right. Matthew Henry, very popular. Matthew Henry, his strength, very devotional. Very devotional, very practical in life, practical application. All right, so for those of you who like it, you will know why. All right, so very devotional, um, generally conservative. But now that you have studied, have some idea about allegorical, it's safer for you to read Matthew Henry. The weakness of Matthew Henry is he's very allegorical. Very allegorical. All right, I give you an example. What, is, what he allegorizes on. Okay, so all these are put on the internet. I'll give you examples of everything that I say here. All right? I'll actually quote them. Now, so for example, like Matthew Henry, when, when he comments on Leviticus, you know Leviticus means cannot eat this kind of animal, cannot eat that kind of bird, cannot eat that kind of fish, that kind of, cannot eat this, cannot eat that. All right? What's the principle? The principle is simply what? The Christian... Should the, the, the Jewish, the God's people, their life will be very different from the rest of the world. All right, that's the principle. Okay, that's what God is teaching. But He will allegorize. He goes beyond all those principles and He says, for example, we should not eat, like, for example, we should not eat kites and hawks. Hawks, huh? Birds, hawks, birds of prey, eagle, that kind. So we shouldn't eat that because they are. Um, they're basically very aggressive. They are. They're, they're prey. They prey on people. So Christians should not eat that. It's to teach you not to be very aggressive, not to be very, not to be a predator. Okay? So he said, that's why God said don't eat hawks and, and what? And then he said, for example, don't eat certain other animals because they are solitary birds. Solitary, you know, solitary. They are, they're always alone, like owls. Okay? Always alone. So he said, God don't want us to eat that because he don't want the Christian to be sad and lonely. Okay? This is the definition of what? What kind of interpretation? Allegorical. They give meanings. They take one thing, they give meanings to it. Now, it depends on how fertile your imagination is, right? Now, what happens if I say... Um, I don't want to try. <laughs> Alright, so don't, don't allegorize. Alright, don't allegorize. Okay, don't allegorize. So, you, you can come up with all sorts of things. And then the very popular one from, from some people is... Um, God said, anything that don't chew the cud means like cow, animals that eat, but they don't munch, munch, munch the grass, they swallow straight away. God said, those animals you don't eat, right? If animals that don't chew the cud. Huh? So many commentators who allegorize will say, oh, God is saying, don't eat those animals because when we read God's word, we must chew, chew, and get the maximum juice out of it. See, these animals, they swallow straight away. Don't eat them. Right? They give many meanings. Do you ever come across God explaining at all any of these animals? Uh, those that hooves that don't, are not parted, they say don't, don't, because no biblical separation. Uh, fishes got scale, don't, because um, fishes, only those that have scale can eat because there is separation from dirty water. There's no end because I can come up with my own also. All right? God simply chose the fishes randomly. The principle was simply don't 
simply that you, your di- even your diet is going to be different from the rest of the world. You are a different people. Huh? That's why the, the, the principle for us today is still the same. You still can preach that passage. Today you eat, you eat certain of these animals. You eat pork or not? Many of us, the favorite, right? Roast pork, cha siu siu, the famous stalls, always full of people. Right? We eat them. We say, hey, how come? So God taught the principle. Today we still can preach those passages and the principles still remain. Biblical separation from anything that's unclean. That's it. Okay? So allegorizing. So Matthew Henry, very allegorical but very devotional. So now you know what are those things when you read. It's better, right? It's safer. You know how to filter. Understand? Okay, that's why we're covering this, because you asked. Now, C.H. Spurgeon. C.H. Spurgeon, many of you like to read his books, like Morning by Morning, Evening by Evening. Now, he's very devotional, of course, we know. All right? He stirs up your heart to love God. But one of the things, uh, he's very Christ-centered in his preaching, but one of the things about Spurgeon, he is very allegorical. All right? Spurgeon is super allegorical, and Spurgeon is very eloquent, so he can really allegorize very well. All right? So you just have to know, Spurgeon, the, king, the prince of preachers, and indeed he is, no one, uh, we can't get close to this man in his preaching. But you must know his weakness and his writings, allegorical. Okay? Um, but his, his applications are very devotional. Okay. Um, so, for example, he will also not preach on the text. He will just read one, 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 one verse. He may take just one word and he will preach, 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 preach on it. Preach a wonderful message on it that will make you cry and make you turn to God. But actually, that whole verse has nothing to do with what he was preaching. All right? So he often preached out of context, uh, but he's a great um, preacher. He's a great mind. All right, the last one, this is the best. All right, John Calvin. All right, John Calvin, covenantal. So you can't get, you want to have a covenantal um, view that is correct, very precise, very accurate. In a commentary, John Calvin, Reformed Faith. All right, very thorough. In fact, Spurgeon made this commentary about John Calvin. And he says, John Calvin, no trimmer or pruner of text. John Calvin, do not skip. Not like him. All right? He do not skip. He's basically saying, I'm, I'm, I'm Spurgeon, I tend to skip text. But John Calvin goes through everything. All right? John Calvin, do not skip anything. He gave the meaning as far as he knew. His honest intention is to translate Hebrew and Greek as accurately as possible to give the meaning which would naturally be conveyed by these Greek words. Okay? And he, he seeks the mind of the Spirit. He seeks the mind of God. And so John Calvin's commentary is one of the best because he, he really seeks to find the mind of God. But same for John Calvin, one of his big challenges because of reform and back then, Amil. And because of Amil, he allegorizes. Amil. He did not believe in the 1,000 years on earth. I believe if John Calvin is alive today, he will. Okay? Because they never saw Israel coming together as a nation. Many of them didn't see it. Okay, so now these are commentaries. I give you plus minus, very summarized. Okay, uh, I may have just spent the last 15 minutes talking about it, but this is a um, collective work of many, many, many weeks to get it to this point. Okay, so, and I'll, all the details will be on the website with these notes. This notes doesn't have the details because I'll end up with 20 pages. Okay, so when you want to read Barnes, you just take this out. Barnes, okay, Barnes. Oh, Barnes, okay, danger is... He believes that man has the will, the free will, still to choose God as a sinner. Okay, so you need to know how he interprets salvation and how a man gets saved. Okay, so understand? All right, so commentaries very quickly since not many of you use it. I just want to spend 15 minutes on that. Okay, now comes the part that many of you asked about, well, at least some of you asked about. How to approach different genres. Now we get to the lesson. Genres. Look at page number five. Now, how to interpret genres? The base, the, the, what is the meaning of genre? Some, some of you scratching your head, what is a genre? <laughs> how do you even pronounce that word? Okay. Now, it is basically the different types and forms of writing. Different, different writing forms. All right? So, for example, I gave you that. These are the examples of the different genres, different forms. They are narratives. The narrative genre or narrative form is telling story. God narrating the whole event. It's just narrative. 
just narrating to you. Moses went here and then Moses went there and the people did this, the people cried and then the people disobeyed God. Just, just that, all right? Narrating to you. So a lot of, um, 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 like for example, the Old Testament text there, narrative. There's narrative. The book of Acts is like a mix of narrative, just telling you Paul went from place to place. Narrative. Understand? There's a narrative. How do you approach narratives? Okay, we'll, we'll learn. Then what about poetry? All right, so there's another, another genre is poetry. The Psalms, the Song of Solomon, Psalms. The Book of Psalms, they're poetries, right? Or songs also, poetries. People sing to these poems. Um, how, do you, how do you interpret poetry? Is it the same as narratives? Now next, there's prophetic texts, like minor prophets, major prophets, Isaiah and all this. All these are prop- prophetic genre. The books prophesy the future, talking about the future. Okay, prophetic text. And then we have parables, different forms. I single out parables, among other things, is because there are many parables in the Bible, right? In the New Testament, parables. How to interpret parables? What are parables? Okay, so we'll study that. Epistles. Epistles are letters. Epistles, the literal meaning is letter. Right? Paul wrote the letter to the church of Ephesus. Paul wrote the letter to the church of Philippi. Letters. Understand? When you read the epistles, they're actually really letters. It's just today we, we have it bound in the Bible, we, we read as a Bible. Back then the church received it as a letter. And then they read the letter in church. Okay? Epistles. And then eschatology is the end times. End times. Eschatology. So there are different, different genres. Now, why is it important for a believer to understand that? It is not to show, oh, I know genres. I can even pronounce it. <laughs> it's not for that purpose. All right? The reason is because... Now, God did not choose to write the whole Bible in narratives. God did not choose to make the whole Bible poems. All right? The whole Bible is some. Some one, two, don't know how many million. All right? God did not choose to write the Bible in all parables. God chose different ways to write His Word. It means that there are different ways that we have to understand what God is trying to emphasize. Understand? It's just like literature. I don't know, I said this, but Sharon disagreed with me. So students have to tell me. Because we don't know, we have been out of school for so long. All right? They say now, because diff- literature, even when you study literature, you, uh, you, you analyze a poem different from you analyze um, Shakespeare's um, literature. What literature is that one? Macbeth. All right? You approach reading Macbeth and approach reading a poem, and you interpret it differently, right? You, you, you approach it to understand it. It's a difference, all right? Different tools, different thinking. So that God used all this. Then we have to understand what is, how do, you, how do you interpret poetry? There is, all right? So there are proper forms. But we think that now today you're told to not follow any form. Poems, you must be out of the box. As crazy as possible. Is that true? Be as crazy as possible. All right, depends what genre, all right? But typically, I think now is think out of the box, different school. Your school is like that, right? Make you crazy, kind of. Right? Be as crazy as possible. Don't follow any rule. Right? But these are not. There are, there, are, there are general ways that this is written like that. And therefore, if you understand, you apply it like that, you will get the maximum out of that genre. Okay? Understand? So now, let's begin. So first of all, 1B, you must recognize the kind of literature that you're interpreting. Different genres require slightly different approaches in understanding. Okay? I ask you this question. You approach it differently, but does the 4C still apply? The 4C. The 4C must still apply, right? Context. What else? Comparison. Consistency. Common sense. You still apply those rules. Okay, but how do you approach it differently? I show you. Okay, now, um, I want to mention point C first. Okay, point C first. Let me make this point. No page is six, six page six, right at the top C. Now, know as much of the context as of the passage as possible. This means that being familiar with the chapter context and the book context. So what, what is useful for those things? Things like that, right? All right, things like that. Know the context of the book first before you approach your devotion. I want to read the book of um, Romans. 
Know the context first. Know as much of the context as possible. All right? In some cases, it's useful to even know the whole Old and New Testament. Like you want to read the book of Romans. The book of Romans, very useful for you to know Old and New Testament, right? Uh, Adelphi Group, we just went through that um, in detail. Romans is a lot of the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, the Old Covenant, the New Testament, right or not? All this, the First Covenant. If the more you know of the Old and New Testament, the better it is. They say, but I don't know. That's why you start now. <laughs> Keep studying. All right? The more you know, the better. Then I, I made this statement also, the more you, you know the, the Bible, the better you are equipped to interpret the Bible correctly, to draw principles for practice correctly. Okay? Now, I want to make this caveat, huh? please. I say that the following are by no means a comprehensive explanation, but it gives a general and typical approach to the genres. Don't say that this is the only way and this is the detail. All right? There are many, many things involved. I'm just trying to bring out the high-level one for you to roughly have an idea. If I read, I open a psalm. How do I be able to very quickly know how to find out what the psalm is about so that I don't go wrong? Right? You ask, one of the questions you ask, you send to me is, I want to know when I do my devotion if I am interpreting something correctly. Right? You want to know that. Okay? So now I'm trying to help you understand that. Now, first of all, let's go to narratives. If you read narratives, like Numbers, like Exodus, what is the approach? Now, the aim of narratives is to draw principles from events. Principles. Because God will typically in narratives not tell you the principle directly. Okay? Moses struck the rock twice. Hmm? And that's it. Then God said, cannot enter. <laughs> Uh, they say, well, why? All right, so narratives are like that. God just tells you the story. you got to draw the right principle. To do that, you have to know the context very well. Understand that? When you know the context very well, then you know why God says certain things. All right? And usually also maybe some other parts, you use comparison. Some other parts of Scripture, God actually specifically explained why Moses cannot enter. It was simply because Moses disobeyed God in front of the people. Right? You did not sanctify me before them. It was not because, um, not, is it two times, three times, four times? It simply God say, speak to the rock. Instead of speaking, he strike. Alright? So that, you know the context before that was what? Before that, strike, right? But before that, God said, strike, and then water come out. This time, speak. But Moses disobeyed. Moses strike again. So you must draw the principle. When God says do this, you do it. When God says do that, you don't do this. You do that. Understand? So you draw the principle. You don't have to go around about is it three times, four times, that kind of thing. Which rock is this? You know, is this Christ? The principle. So you have to know the context, then you draw the principle. But better still, use other parts of Scripture. The other parts of Scripture told you very clearly. God simply says that you disobeyed me in front of the people. If you disobey me as a leader in front of the people, and I let you go into the promised land, the people say, it's okay. Disobey God and we still get away with it. Then God say, I must set the example. Understand? Okay, so, so narratives are like that. You got to read and read and read. Those of you who do acts, you know that. I always tell you, read the passage three times until it's in your heart, in your mind. And then the pictures start to appear in your mind. Oh, Samuel was walking. Samuel did that. The whole picture is in your mind. Narratives are like that. You got it very, very, very clear. That's why those of you who take Old Testament, you take the quiz, Dr. Quack's quiz? Uh, you don't, huh? For us, we do Old Testament history. Dr. Quack's quiz is to the point, how many, how many priests stand in front of the cart? How many priests stand on the left side of the cart? How many priests stand on the right side of the cart? Uh -huh. You mean we're supposed to know that, memorize, study that? Yes. Why? Because the more you know the narrative, the whole picture very clear in your mind, when you read, you know, you know why God says certain things. Because you know what's happening. Understand? All right? like, like when um, King Saul take the spear and the javelin and throw at David. All those things you imagine in your mind. Every, every single detail. Narratives are like that. You know the detail, then you draw the principle. All right? So that, narrative. Now, know the historical context is very useful. Now, be relevant, be specific, be accurate in application. You want to enjoy your Bible study, ask yourself questions. Relevant questions, all right? Relevant questions. Now, what I mean be relevant? Sometimes we, 
we do Bible study, say, now what is this passage teaching us? The glory of God. The whole Bible is about the glory of God. <laughs> right? It's the glory of God. Or uh, what is this about? Obey God. Everything is about obey God. Right? So when you read narratives, you ask yourself more questions. What aspect of the glory of God? Now, what aspect of, of obedience? Be more specific. What is that obedience about? I'll give you an example. Now, if the more you know the Bible, the better it is. When you study, you say, oh, now you can draw principles for yourself. We just did, uh, the men will know this, in the men and husbands, the husband and the men's fellowship. Now, in 1 Samuel, now God says that David got married. David got married and then the Philistines keep coming to disturb the land, do battle with the land. And David went out to battle. David went out to fight the war. Hmm? You just read. Now, if you don't know much of the Bible, you don't study the word of God, you say, oh, David got married and then the people came and disturbed, keep coming and disturbed the land and David went out and fight the battle. Okay, then move on. Don't know why God mentioned that. Why did God mention that? You don't know. Because you, you don't study the word. Those of you who did Leviticus, straight away, one of them in the class, because he knows the answer. Then he draws the principle. Narratives are like that. You must know the Bible. The more you know the Bible, the better. Do you know why? God says when a man first gets married, what, can, what, what, is he, what privilege does he have? For one whole year, no need to bathe. <laughs> no, for one whole year, no need to go to battle, right? For one whole year, no need to go to battle because then uh, they're often battle, then the young man must go. But God says for those that get married, first year, be at home with your wife, you know, build a relationship with your wife. Right? You don't have to go to battle. That's an exception, right? Those of you who studied Leviticus, remember that. Say away the man put Oh, because those who get married, actually no need to go to battle. Means when God wrote that and they keep coming, David didn't need to go. But David went. He shows his love for God's nation. Then you ask yourself, what principle can I draw for myself? I may have rights. I may, I may have privileges. But when God needs, God's work needs to be done, I lay aside those privileges. I lay aside those rights. I still serve. I will go. Right? So if you don't know God, so you read, oh, I don't know, I move on. Don't worry. Just keep studying little by little. I believe that man that night who put out his hand and said, because actually when they first got married, I'm sure when he was studying, oh, go to, no need to go to war, what does it mean? And then move on. Remember, I keep saying, God say, how does God bring the word of God back to your remembrance? The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the things that you have learned. If you never study the passage, the Holy Spirit go and dig, 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 want to help you, also cannot. Because you don't have that in your word, in your heart. All right, so narratives are like that. The more you know the Bible, the better. Actually, for every, every book. All right, narratives. Narratives, base principle, draw principle. Don't allegorize. All right? Don't say the tabernacle tent. I always use the example because I read it before. Or read the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the, 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 the nail on the ground is Christ. You know, how, to have, how can that be Christ? Or because half of the nail is in the air, half in the ground. It's like Jesus, half on earth, half of him is in heaven. So that is Christ. Don't, don't, don't allegorize. Just draw principles. Okay? So narratives. Now, Psalms. How do you read Psalms? There's a trick. Okay? Now, I want to emphasize, uh, this is generally true about Psalm. I'm not saying every single Psalm. But generally, this is a good check for you. Now, look, the focus of Psalm is usually, the focus of the Psalm is usually mentioned at its beginning and summarized at the end. Okay? Usually at the beginning and summarized at the end. So, when you approach a Psalm, you open a Psalm, the first few verses are very important. The Psalmist will tell you what he's writing about. The subject of the psalm. At the end part, he will usually come back and summarize or reinforce the same point. Understand? Where's the middle then? The middle is usually then all the different aspects about this thing that he's trying to emphasize. Understand? So you ask me, I do my devotion, I read psalm, then I say, oh, I think God is teaching this. Am I correct or not? If it is psalm, apply this principle generally, that is how the psalmist poems are written. Okay? I'll give you an example. Let's turn to Psalm 48. I, I just rough, I just anyhow, I just flipped there and I just took one. Right? Psalm 48. Yeah, I'm sure there are other better ones. Now, Psalm. 
Ah, I got to move really fast and then because I want to do the examples, I want to test you. <laughs> Can't wait to test you. Psalm 48. Alright, now Psalm 48. It begins with, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Alright, so it begins with, Great is the Lord. So the focus, the psalmist now is telling you already, I want to write about God, His greatness. Okay? Now, you notice at the end, what does he emphasize? Verse 14. And he says, For this is our God. For this God, this great God is our God. Forever and ever He will be our guide even unto death. You see, he focused on the greatness of God and this is our God. Very comforting, right? And you see, if you read all the middle part, he's talking about how great God is, how wonderful He is, and he describes all those things. Understand? It's like, just like you write a letter to a friend. Nowadays, we don't write poem. You begin by, by stating what's the point of this letter, then you talk about the details about this particular point you're talking about, then you finish again about great is this God, and this God is our God. That is what he's trying to talk about. And in between, he tells you, wow, this God is like that, like, 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 like that. Then in the end, you read, this is our God, then you get very excited. Okay? So this is Psalm. Understand? Typically, Psalm is like that. I'm not say always, but typically. Now, next, prophetic. Very quickly, a prophetic. Prophetic, we still use literal method. One thing about prophetic, the prophecies, please never ever get this wrong. Point F, number two. Only one fulfillment per prophecy. One coupon per customer. <laughs> All right, only one fulfillment per prophecy. No double fulfillment, please. Remember that. That's a very important literal interpretation. Okay? There are many who believe, who teach multiple prophecy, multiple fulfillment. You end up with all sorts of doctrinal errors. I just quoted one example, Isaiah 7, 14. This is one of the things that threw Christendom into disarray because of a, the belief, the, the beginning of teaching that prophecies can have multiple fulfillment. Okay, now... Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Right? Where is the fulfillment? Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child. Same. Now, the multiple fulfillment people, or they read different, uh, they read prophecy differently, they will say, no, this was about um, the king's wife. Because this word virgin can be Alma, can be also um, a woman. Okay, and then, from there, all sorts of problems came about and then finally say, no, this formula is not about Christ. Christ was not born of a virgin also. See, problems when you have multiple fulfillment. That's worse. Walter Kaiser, some of you may come across his books, Walter Kaiser. His, his way of interpreting prophecies, and you will see some of this in commentaries. There is a school of interpretation of commentaries like that. If God gives a prophecy at this point, Anything that is after this point in the future, you cannot take it as a fulfillment of the prophecy. I know, some of you like, that was a prophecy, it's always about the future, right? But Walter Kaiser came up with this very popular theo- uh, prophet, pro- prophecy interpretation. You can only read this prophecy in view of the past, everything that has happened until that point. So he's the one that argued that therefore Matthew 123, because it's after Isaiah, it is never about Christ's virgin birth. Okay? All kind of mess. For us, very simple. One interpretation, literal interpretation, one fulfillment. That's it. Okay? Now, that's why it also goes down to the problem of Israel is no longer God's people. All the promises that God gives to Israel. Now there's another fulfillment. It will be fulfilled in the church. No, it will be fulfilled in Israel, in the tribulation and after. Okay, so now next, very quickly. Um, but please remember, uh, when you interpret prophecies, language, you interpret literally, but languages can contain imageries and figures of speech. Doesn't mean that you, literal means everything is literal. I'll give you an example, right? Not wooden literal. The woman sitting on seven hills in Revelation 17, 19. That's a prophecy, right? The woman sitting on seven hills. If you interpret literally, wooden literal, what happens? The hills are a very small puddle of, of sand, and the woman has a very funny figure. <laughs> we see on seven puddles of sand. All right? So there are images, there are figures of speech. 
but it's a direct interpretation. For example, we'll look at an example afterwards. Okay, eschatology. Now, parables. Okay, very interesting. Please note, parables. Don't anyhow interpret parables. I hear all sorts of interpretations, sometimes among ourselves also. Oh, this parable is this, this in between. There is a proper way to understand parable. Okay? Please. Now, this is it. Parables. The meaning is usually, not always, but usually it is given at the end. You read a parable, you want to find the meaning of the parable, you ask yourself, hey, I do my devotion, I read parable, am I interpreting it correctly? Go to the end of the parable. It's usually summarized at the end. What this parable is about. Okay? Understand that? So if your interpretation is not the same as the end, you have interpreted it wrongly. Number one. Number two, um, for parables, there's usually only one meaning, one point to the parable. Okay? Don't embellish don't focus on the embellishment. When Christ tells a parable, all right, the Good Samaritan, for example, he will say the Good Samaritan, um, he was walking and then he found, uh, he found uh, um, the man that was robbed and injured in the ground, the Jew. Okay? Now, he gave a lot of details. He gave a lot of details. You have to separate the unnecessary details from the necessary details that are emphasizing the point that is being made. Okay, you don't go and start and read, oh, the donkey. Let me go and analyze the donkey. Then you are focusing on the wrong details. All right, Christ, he was on a donkey. That's it. The focus is on the, the two person. Okay, about your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Right, who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor, but you can be more specific. What do you mean everyone is my neighbor? Why do you think God gave the detail? Is the detail that one is a Jew and one is a Samaritan important or not? That would be an important example because it's about neighborliness, right? Are these two good neighbors? They're not on good terms. Then you begin to draw more things from that, all right? Okay, so don't focus on the embellishments wrongly. Understand that, okay? Parables. And don't allegorize, huh? don't halfway through, this is Trinity, this is um, God the Father, this is God the Son, that is all sorts of things. Okay, just focus on the point that is being mentioned. Parables. Okay, now epistles. Now epistles, very quickly, epistles are doctrines stated very in the verses. The letters. Epistles are the most straightforward. Pray without ceasing. You don't have to go and analyze. Okay, you don't have to analyze. The doctrines are openly presented to you. Okay. Now, so, so the, um, those are like that. And you, what you want to catch is the emphasis. In there, usually the grammar, the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives have their much significance. Okay, how it is presented, the tenses and all that. Of course, if you know languages, more useful. Okay, so for example, there, like God say, don't do this. There are many don'ts. Don't start or don't begin. Okay, all those kind of things. So, par so episodes are very direct. Very direct. And then you draw the applications correctly from there. Okay, last one, eschatology. Eschatology is um, interpreting the future. Now, it's also a literal method. Please, although it's prophecy, interpret literally. That is the difference between us and all Presbyterians. You understand that? We use the literal method in, in interpreting eschatology. That's why we are premillennialist. We believe that there is a millennium. All right. Most Reformed faith, they use the allegorical method when it comes to eschatology. They allegorize away the 1,000 years. Okay? So you must know the difference. Now, you read down here. Okay? Um, page 6 at the bottom. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Who is this? Satan. Set a seal upon him. Then you read at the bottom. Look at the last line. Satan is in the bottomless pit, the last sentence, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Interpret it literally. Christ say that Satan will be shut up and we will be reigning with Christ on earth for a thousand years. This is a literal thousand years. Comparing scriptures with scriptures, another C, right? Use that C. Now, Satan is not bound. Satan is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Is Satan bound now? No. Satan is not bound now. So use scripture to compare with scripture. 
you don't allegorize here. You say, oh, um, all this is, this 1,000 years is already, now we are in it, you know, we're living through it, and all that kind of thing. No, it's literal, one, literal 1,000 years. Repeatedly in Revelation, it keeps talking about this 1,000 years. It's literal. No need to say this is um, just a period of time. That's spiritualizing it away. Same for Israel. Okay, so now, that's it. We're done. We've got 25 minutes to do, to test you. Now you put everything together. Let me just ask you very quickly. How to find out what is the meaning of the parable? Huh? Usually where? At the, begin- at the, at the, at the end. All right? Usually at the end. Okay, then you know you're staying true. Now when you read Psalm, how do you find out very quickly a rough idea what's the focus of the Psalm? In the beginning. And in the end also, in the beginning, you state what you want to talk about. At the end, it summarizes or re-emphasizes. In, the be- in between, talk about all the important things about this subject. Okay? What about... How many... What, is the, what, what about narratives? What are you trying to draw? Principles. Draw principles. Not allegorize. Draw principles. Okay? Um, so that you apply the principles correctly. What about... Um, pro- prophecies. How do you interpret prophecies? One fulfillment, one prophet, one fulfillment per prophecy. Okay, okay, good. You have a high level idea. It's not as simple as that, but this is a good guide for a beginning. Okay, now let's move on. Now I'm going to test you now. Yay! All right. Now here are some commonly misinterpreted passages. Now put on your thinking cap. Let's very quickly first. What are the four C's? Context. I always start at context. Context. Comparison. Compare what? Scriptures with scriptures. Use other parts of scriptures to confirm it. Okay? Compare also with what? Theology. Oh, sorry. Let's move to the next. Next, see consistency. Is it consistent with other parts of scriptures? Is it consistent with theology? Consistent with doctrine? Alright? Consistency. What's the last C? Common sense. Okay? Common sense means the direct sense. It reads it 1,000 years. Many times it was 1,000 years on earth, with a throne on earth. Common sense literally just interpret the common meaning of those words. Common sense. Okay, not your own common sense, all right? The common sense of the word is as is commonly understood. Because most of us don't have common sense. Okay, now, Matthew 18.20. Now, we read. Matthew 18.20, let's read together. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Favorite phrase we use at prayer meeting. The moment we bow our head, we quote, Lord, you have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in the midst of us. Okay? Right? Most of us say that. Now, what is the... Question A. What is the teaching? What is the teaching? Okay, what is the common teaching usage today? Means, God, we gather, alright? God, we are gathering. God, please listen to us because we are very serious. No, God, a few of us, alright? God, please listen to us. Okay? So, the more the merrier. Huh? Okay, so now, you see two or three, God, no, we are five, you know? Alright? So, that's the common thinking, right? That's why we keep saying that. Now, I want you to turn there and you tell me what you think it is about. And that's the reason why I want you to, to tell the reason, besides testing you. You've got to turn your Bible, huh? Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Okay, who wants to be the first to try and answer? What do you think is the teaching? And then I'll ask you why do you, which, how do you come to that conclusion? Which rule did you apply? Okay, I shall call names. But if you volunteer, I don't have to call your name. What about um, our cameraman, Ichung? Um, it's about conflict, particularly amongst our brethren. And it says in verse, uh, in chapter 18, verse uh, um, 
15, for instance, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So it's talking about um, conflict, mm -hmm. uh, trespassing against each other, mm -hmm. and that uh, it says later to the um, in verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Uh, that's after verse 16, which is uh, taking a witness. And so it's in the context of con uh, resolving conflict between brethren mm -hmm. uh, in the church. And that at the end it says, for where two or three are gathered, gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's um, agreeing on something that um, uh, they're asking in God in terms of maybe forgiveness mm -hmm. uh, for um, after having agreement in a conflict. Okay, so Ichung believes it is about conflict management, right? Conflict management, and he gave us which. So, which rule did you apply? Oh. <laughs> What's the history here? <laughs> She's just giving the right answer. Oh. All right, what are the four C's? Context. context, okay? You apply context. Right, don't read one verse and then it becomes cliche. Every time you just keep using. Sometimes you use, 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 God, God must be like, that's not what I mean, that's not what I mean. Okay, keep saying, keep saying, keep saying. All right, it was, the context was conflict management, right? Okay, so now, what do you think is about this conflict management? Who want to try? Because it's a very good practice. Then when you do your devotion, or when you always use certain words, then you read, hey, that's not what it means. Then you do, do your devotion, you ask yourself, you apply the principles. You miss one very important word. Okay, listen very carefully. Now you practice, all right? Christ said, where two or three are gathered in my name. Was this two or three mentioned somewhere else? Verse 16, yeah, someone said verse 16, right? In verse 16, it was mentioned two or three again, right? Then he mentioned two or three again. Now, what are these two or three about? Who are they? Very good. Witnesses. Witnesses, okay? Now, what is Christ saying when two or three, and in fact, this is from the, is from the Old Testament. Those of you who did John with me, remember? How many witnesses and it's confirmed? Two, three. That's why Christ will quote the different events. He say, all these are witnesses that I am God. Remember? Uh, two or three. This is a principle to the Jews where two or three, these are witnesses, confirmed. Now, then he said two or three again. He's talking about witnesses. Now, why do you think Christ say, if you have conflict, first in verse 16, if two brothers have conflict, try and go to the brother, get it resolved. Verse 16, now if he won't hear you, go to two or three. Take two or three witnesses. If still won't hear you, verse 17, Go to the church. Means a brother who refused to repent. You talk to the person. Still refuse. You bring some witnesses. They all say, look, brother, you are wrong. Still refuse to, to repent. What's the next step? Church level. Bring it to church. All right? Church discipline already. And then Christ say, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. What do you think Christ is trying to teach? Because I asked the question, now what is lost if we misinterpret this passage? If we interpret this passage as the more people pray, the better it is. But we lose the whole teaching of what God was saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? What is the interpretation of the Bible to find out what God is trying to tell us? Now is God talking about prayer meeting here? No. Is God talking about more people gather together to pray? No. So what do you think Christ is saying? Christ is saying this, when you have conflict, when you gather with witnesses, please know one thing. This is not a nice thing, you know. You, you don't have to pray this prayer, actually. Christ is saying that I will be in your midst as judge. I am God. Even in front of witnesses, you want to deny, I can see your heart. But the witnesses cannot see your heart. And when you have a conflict, you bring witnesses before, before the person and the person still refuses to repent and still lie and still deny. God said, you better be careful. I am in your midst. I know your heart. So when a person read this, when a person hear this straight away in his heart, oh no, Christ, I may, I may, I may lie to these witnesses, but Christ, no. Christ is among us. He's a judge that does not 
I can't see, but he sees my heart. Then he will tell the truth. Understand that? Do you see the context? It's about witnesses. So do you still want to pray that? Unless you're having an argument, Christ, please be in our midst to be witness, be our judge. All right? So it's not about that. So when I ask you this question, now what is lost if we misinterpreted this passage? What is lost? The whole teaching that we need to be honest in a conflict resolution time. That whole teaching that God intended is lost. Do you understand why it's so important to use the rules to interpret scriptures? Okay? Understand that? Now I'll ask you another question. What is wrong if we interpreted it correct, incorrectly? What is the problem? Rowena, you wanted to... Say again? Yeah, Bible is no more the authority, correct? But, but what I'm trying to get at is this. Remember I say when you interpret wrongly, you get wrong doctrines? You get wrong doctrines. You get a wrong teaching. When you get a wrong teaching, you will end up with wrong what? Practices. Okay? Now, if you interpret this, you will have this doctrine. More people, Christ promised to hear. That will be the doctrine. Correct? When two or three get in I'll be in a midst. Because you're talking about prayer, you're thinking of prayer. Then the doctrine is this. Now, what will there be wrong? What will be the wrong practice? Yes, the more the merrier. The more people, the more effective our prayer. Do you think that's the right theology? That is not. You read the Bible over and over again. Paul prayed alone. Christ prayed alone. Was it the more the merrier? You get a wrong, wrong. You interpret wrongly. You subconsciously think, when you're in trouble, do you know what you'll do? Quickly call. Call pastor, call um, Bible, Bible school, Sunday school teacher, call everyone. Okay, hey, can we gather to pray? Can we, can we meet today and pray? Why? Because God said two or three gathered, more effective. Wrong practice. You will feel that Christ will only hear you if you gather more people. Do you understand that? Okay, so wrong interpretation, wrong teaching, wrong practice, wrong thinking affects your walk with God. Okay, so this passage is not about the more people. Now, then I'll ask you another question. What passage would you use instead for this commonly believed? For what is commonly believed in this verse? If you want to talk about God wants us together, is it true or not? Now, I'm not saying God don't want us together. Huh? Does God want us together? Yes. God said, don't forget the assembling of yourselves, right? Don't neglect. Some neglect. Some of them neglected the assembling. They neglected coming together. And God said, don't. Okay? If you want, you can write it down um, next to it. Hebrews 10.25 God does want His people to gather together. But this is not the passage to teach that. Okay? So you want to pray. God, you have asked, you have told us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves. So please be among us as we assemble together. Alright? Okay? Now I want you to realize one thing. I hope none of you is sitting there, ah yeah, this guy is so pedantic, so picky. I hope none of you are thinking that. Eh? Because this is what God is saying, you know. God is saying this. His intention is, I will be in your midst as a judge. But you say, ah, yeah, just use it. Ah. Yeah, sounds good, right? You better be sure that God is hearing. <laughs> say, God, you say this, but ah, yeah, God, don't be so... I want to say this. I want to say... I want this verse to mean like that. Alright, God? What do you think God feels? Alright? So this is not a small thing. I'm not picking on things for fun. Let's be... I always emphasize this. Why are we doing this? My friends, have the highest reverence for God's word. When you read God's word, read it like it is God's voice speaking. Every book of it, every chapter of it, every verse of it, every word of it, every letter of it, every single one is God speaking. Don't use it lightly as you want to use it. Okay? God's word is to be approached with the highest reverence that is the living God that has said it. Okay? So we must not just use it lightly and say, I want to use this for this purpose. Cannot. Okay, understand that? Now next, I ask you very quickly, maybe I choose another one. Now, this is another one that is famous. Philippians number four. Let's do number four first because we're running out of time. Number four. 
Okay, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So many of the books you read today, front cover is this, and they basically say, with Christ I can overcome all obstacles and succeed in all that I aspire to. Mm, we always pray that, Lord, with you I can do all things. Now, what does the Bible really teach you? Is it that I can overcome all obstacles and succeed in all things that I aspire to? Philippians 4.13 Does it mean that you will overcome that all the difficulties around you will be gone? I can do all things. I can get rid of all things. Does it mean that? No, right? Why? Why do you say that? To move quickly with you. What does the Bible really teach you? Why, why do you say it is not that? Because of the verses before that. Now, why is the verses before that? I know how to be a base and know how to abound. Know how to be both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Is Paul saying that, before, before he said, I can do all things, is Paul saying that I can get rid of suffering, I can get rid of poverty, I can get rid of lacking in things in life, I can get rid of difficulties in life? Paul cannot overcome this, you know. Paul said these things are all there. <laughs> but what is Paul saying then? What do you think? Edward. Very good. This passage is about being able to endure through all this because the context tells us this. It is not that I can overcome and get rid of these things and I will succeed. I'm poor, I will become rich. I'm sick, I will become healthy. I'm weak, I will become strong. I'm in lack, I will have much. I can overcome all things. No. Paul is saying that despite all, despite all these things, I can endure. I can do all things. I can endure all things. Because Christ will strengthen me in those situations. Now, this verse is used as a result of, um, in other words, as a result of this verse, we have the health and wealth gospel. All right? I can do all things. They tell you, you can, friend, you can do all things. Don't attend those churches that tell you you will suffer on this earth. When you live godly, you will say, no, you will, you will be conquerors. More than conquerors, that's the other one. Okay, so understand that it's about God will help us to endure. Now, if you, what is lost if you misinterpret this text? I keep asking this question. The comfort of being able to endure is lost. Because if you interpret it as things will get better, with Christ you can do all things, things will get better. What will happen? You get more and more discouraged, right? How come things are getting worse? How come they're not getting better? The whole teaching of wow, things are bad, I can endure, is all lost. Instead, you keep looking up for things that get better. I have, a, I, used to, I have a friend who had cancer in the hospital. The family quoted this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. We are more than conquerors. She keep quoting the verse walking up and down the room in the hospital. And then you want to pray, I want to talk about, you know, tell him, look, um, Christ will, God will give you strength to endure all this, even you have cancer. She don't want to hear, no, 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 don't say that, don't say that. God say, I can, I, can to, I can do all things to Christ. I can overcome this sickness. I will get better. So the mother keeps saying, no, 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 he will get better. In my heart, I was thinking, it's totally misinterpreted and the whole verse was supposed to comfort the son. The son will not get better. He will not get healed. He's in very bad stage of cancer. This verse is supposed to comfort him, enable him to go through. But instead, the son keep looking forward. Oh, this verse means I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be healed. I will overcome. I can do all things. I can overcome cancer. The whole meaning of the text lost for him. Very sad. Right? So remember, wrong interpretation, very sad. I want, you to ask, I want to ask you another question. Matthew 7, 1. Let's read together. You are, okay, Matthew 7, 1. Sorry, I forgot to print it out. Matthew 7, 1. Shall we turn there? Matthew chapter 7. So, it's very simple. I was just using context, right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Let's read. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Okay, very, very well used verse. You tell another person, hey, you know, you better stop doing this. This is sin. And then what does the person say? Hello? Didn't you read? Matthew 7, 1, you are being judgmental. Jesus told us not to judge. Recently, someone came into our midst and 
She said, hey, your church, how come your church judge? Jesus said we should not judge. How come your church say that charismatism is wrong? We should not judge. It is wrong to judge. Okay, because she said, oh, God said, cannot judge. Don't be judgmental. Please, don't be judgmental. Now, what does the Bible teach here? Do you think God said we are not to judge? No, right? The context. What is Christ rebuking? Very good. All right, you see the word so clearly. Verse 5, thou hypocrite. It was about hypocrisy. You have a beam in your eyes, but you keep judging someone who have respect. God said, remove the beam in your eyes first. God is condemning what? Hypocritical judgment. Understand? Hypocritical judgment. Hypocrisy. Did God, does God ever tell us to judge? Let me ask you. Does the Bible, t- God, does the Bible, does, does the Bible tell us to judge? You write down this verse, huh? I write for you. Matthew 7.24 God tells us not to judge according to appearance, but according to righteous judgment. God said, judge righteous judgment. Don't judge hypocritically. Matthew 7, 16. God said, by their fruits, you will recognize them. God asks us to recognize fruits. Means judging, right? Look at their fruits. Judge them by their fruits. How they live their life. And then Luke 7, 13, 7, Luke 17, 13. He say, if your brother sin, rebuke him. <gasps> Not even judge, no, scold him. <laughs> Expose him. For what? So that he will stop sinning and turn back to God. Matthew 18, uh, we read that just now. If your brother sin, show him his fault. Tell him. Are we supposed not to judge? No. Judge righteous judgment. Help the brother to repent. God is not saying cannot judge at all. But don't be hypocrites. Don't judge because you're a hypocrite for ulterior reasons, motives. Okay? Now, I just want to do one last one because it has to do with our faith, so I have to finish that. Can you please look at example number three? Now, this verse, this passage, is a very famous passage that's often used to preach about revival. So a preacher, if he wants to say, I want to preach about revival, I want to stir up the, the, the church, very often preachers will turn to Ezekiel chapter 37 to preach about revival, revive the church. Okay, now listen to Ezekiel 37 and then we finish. Now, Ezekiel 37. I will ask you what method you use. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Okay, we have no time to read the whole thing, but basically the summary is... um, there's a valley full of bones, chapter 37, verse 1, there was a valley full of bones, and God basically um, said that he, will, he asked this prophet to prophesy, Ezekiel prophesy, and God will bring these bones to life. Look at verse 5. Thus yet the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you. I will bring, put muscles. I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord I am the Lord and oh then preacher will preach about revival God will bring revival so very often people read this and they say um, um, God can change our hearts give us hearts of flesh God can make us live again although we are backslided God can send revival to our churches to our city alright you just go look at the internet a lot of messages on this okay now is this about God reviving the New Testament church is this passage. Now, this is prophetic text. Huh? Remember, I say prophetic text. How many fulfillment? One fulfillment. That's the um, importance. Now, so what do you think this is? Is the fulfillment about the church being revived in the New Testament? Or is the prophecy about something else? Very good. I see so many. I hear so many. Israel, 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 Israel. Israel, right? All right. Now, how do you know? Verse what? Verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Which, which C is this? Common sense. Alright? God says, God gives you the common sense of it. Behold, he said, look, please look. This is the house of Israel. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Okay? Now, is that enough? Did God clarify further? 
Verse 12, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This prophecy is about what? This is a prophetic text. So this prophecy is about Israel. Israel. It's not about anything else. All right. So you will hear people preaching, oh, no, no. This is about God reviving the church. This is about, um, what else? This is about God changing our heart. And this is the fulfillment of Christ. Ultimate fulfillment is Christ. Why do they get all this? Okay, allegorizing. They allegorize away Israel. That's why many churches do not believe that Israel will be restored. Do we believe Israel is restored? Will be restored? We believe because of very common sense, direct prophecies that God says He will bring Israel back to the land which He has. And one day in the in the tribulation, all Israel will believe. This fulfillment will be will happen. Okay. So please do not interpret it as anything else. That's why we are different from all other reformed faith. Other reformed faith do not believe that Israel will be brought back because we are Bible Presbyterian. You know why we are called Bible Presbyterian? Because we put the Bible as the authority. Direct literal interpretation tells us that Israel will come back. That's why we are different from other Presbyterians. We are Bible Presbyterians. We interpret the scriptures literally. Okay? Alright, so now that I, the reason I want to do this is because there has, it relates to our particular interpretation as Bible Presbyterians. Okay, can you allow me to do the conclusion and then we close? Can you look at page 7 at the bottom? Now, I want to just summarize everything very quickly. Now, please remember these, few, these simple words. The Bible is the Word of God. Learn to say that. The Bible is the Word of God. It is not the Word of man. Don't just say it without understanding. The Bible is the Word of God. Hence, we must know what God says, not what, what we want Him to say. Okay, please. Number two, only the practice of literal method interpretation can we know God's meaning. We have seen that already, and we see the dangers if we don't. Number three, other methods of allegorizing, spiritualizing, reader-dependent. What is reader-dependent? Reader-dependent means, I read, I understand, you read, you understand differently, please. Don't tell me I'm wrong. No, we have to know what God says. There is one answer. Okay, all this makes man the authority of the word instead of God. Now, wrong interpretation, point number four, wrong interpretation results in wrong doctrines and wrong practices. We do not want our church to go down that road. Number five, the word of God is written to reveal God to man. It is not man-centric. Please, when you do your devotion, I want to emphasize this again and again and again and again and again. When you do your devotion, when you study the word of God, the Bible is written to reveal God to you. Approach God's word like that. What do I mean? Many of us read the Bible like that. God, I got a lot of trouble at work. Can you please, God, please, today my devotion, can you show me what to do? We are always finding solutions for our life, right? You know what happens when you're always finding solutions for your life? You start to allegorize. You want to marry that girl. Whole family say no. No matter what text you read, even Judas, you can allegorize and say, God say marry that person. Because you are always finding solution for yourself to your own life's problem of what you want. Don't read God's word like that. The why I teach about literal interpretation is find out God's mind. Leave all these things aside. Learn about God. You will grow. When the more you know of God, the smaller your problems become. That problem may has God will give you an answer that has nothing to do with your problem and you'll go to work whistling. You know why? Because you have seen your God. You, you know him better. He is far bigger than you realize. Every other problem is very small. The Bible is written to reveal God to us. The chief end of man is the glory of God. It's not about us. Any doctrine that is man-centric is a dangerous doctrine. It cannot be from the Bible. Okay, so I want to emphasize that. Number six. When, oh, that's what I said, all right? So don't keep finding solutions for yourself. Just say, God, I want to learn about you. Sometimes I preach, I get very stressed, you know. Because I always feel that if I don't give you an application for your life, you'll go away unhappy. And I always pray, Lord, I, I should not care about that. If I can show more of you to them, who, how you work, what you are, you will know the application yourself. All right? Now, number eight. Number seven. The more we know his word, the more we, effort we put in, the more we will get out of our Bible studies. Please believe that. Study to show thyself approved. The more you study year after year, it will grow. You can't go to bodybuilding shop and then think you will develop muscles overnight. Last one, there is no shortcut, but the payoffs are tremendous spiritually. Okay, shall we read Isaiah 28, 10 together? 
precept for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, here, here a little, and a, here a little, and there a little. All right, little bit. You don't know you're growing. You are. You are. All right. Take time. Take time. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you have reminded us that we should study, and that takes effort. And you have reminded us that it is precept upon precept, Lord, little teachings upon teachings, detail upon detail. And even we are studying, just learning a little bit here and a little bit there. But Lord, we are growing. Father, I pray that we will learn, having learned this um, interpretation methods, we will apply it in our devotion, and we will also get excited as we, Lord, truly love your word and love you more, and not just seek solutions for our life in your word. So Lord, reveal yourself more, we pray. May everyone who are here be richly blessed with a life long learning and growth. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.